Hi there. You're listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast. Episode 43, The First Punic War, Part 2. Let them drink. The southern coast of Sicily is home to some of the bluest waters of the Mediterranean Sea, the joy of travelers and tourists throughout the ages. Yet, in 256 BC, harsh reality betrayed the normally idyllic landscape. The flotsam and jetsam of wooden planks, linen sailcloth, and rope littered the shores of Cape Ecnomus, a sign of the destruction of roughly 90 Carthaginian and Roman warships, while the remains of what used to be their crew members bobbed up and down with the waves, mutilated by sword and spear, or having succumbed to Poseidon's domain and drowned, some thirty to 40,000 in all, meeting a watery grave. The victor, the Roman consul Marcus Atilius Regulus, had much to be proud of. The defeat of the Carthaginians in their natural habitat, the sea, was the linchpin that enabled the remaining 300 ships to continue on their great expedition. For nearly a decade, Rome and Carthage had fought, largely on the island of Sicily, and while the Romans were confident that they could best any Carthaginian army on land or sea and claim the island's fertility for their own, the Romans were no more successful at dislodging Carthage than the Greeks of Syracuse who had clashed with their Punic rivals off and on for nearly 250 years. Yet, a plan had been in the works that could have ended the war. The Roman legion was dominant against any number of land armies that Carthage could buy and throw their way. And so, Rome wanted to bring the fight to Carthage directly and invade North Africa in the most daring logistical endeavor the Republic had ever yet organized. The invasion was not without precedent. Agathocles, the tyrant and king of Syracuse during the late 4th, early 3rd century BC, had proved that Carthage could be bested on their own heartland, though was ultimately incapable of conquering it outright, and Pyrrhus of Epirus had planned to do so nearly two decades prior. Though the goal was less to conquer North Africa, and more to force Carthage to evacuate Sicily, unlike Agathocles, the Romans had the money and manpower to afford it, and there was no direct threat to their own home territory from either political dissidents nor external enemies. Appropriately, Regulus and the fleet from Ecnomus made their landing on the shores of Libya, near the town of Aspis, which was promptly stormed by the Romans almost as soon as they disembarked from their ships. Taking stock of the invasion force, Regulus's army numbered some 15,000 foot soldiers and only about 500 cavalry, while the rest of the ships and the 20,000 captive African civilians would return back home under the other consul, Manlius. Regulus seized Tunis as his base of operations and ravaged the countryside, and any effort to push the Romans back was hamstrung by a meek and divided Carthaginian leadership. At this point, things were not looking good for the Carthaginians, to say the least. The surviving ships of Echnomus took one look at the besieged Aspis and left it to its fate, concentrating on shoring up the defenses of Carthage itself. It might seem callous, but the Carthaginian Senate was dealing with another crisis on its frontiers, as the Numidians had begun to revolt and raid, as eager to take advantage of the Carthaginian misfortune as they were to serve in their armies. Peasants fleeing from both the Romans and the Numidians swelled the city's numbers and put immense strain on their supplies, and despite an army recalled from Sicily, they were not confident in their chances. Before the first Roman tent was set at the city limits, Polybius tells us that a Roman envoy had approached the Carthaginian Senate and offered to set up negotiations between the two parties. Regulus was fully aware of the challenge of besieging the jewel of North Africa, but was less concerned about whether it was even possible and more focused on ensuring the submission of Carthage before the next consul arrived and snatched his triumph from underneath him, and so he tried to end the war during his tenure. In his hubris, Regulus put almost impossibly harsh terms on Carthage, despite not having yet captured the city, Cassius Dio claiming that he demanded the complete surrender of both Sicily and Sardinia, an indemnity for the cost of the war, and turning Carthage into an effective protectorate and client state. These claims outraged the Punic Senate so much that they would commit to fighting until the bitter end. Perhaps Regulus was aware of the circumstances that the Carthaginians found themselves in, but other sources indicate that the Carthaginians offered a peace treaty first, and that the Roman Senate would extend the term of his command to finish the job if needed. Whatever the case may be, the war continued, but the Carthaginians' brave face did little to help the situation without any additional solutions. Enter Xanthippus, 
Traditionally, he is known as Xanthippus of Lacedaemonia, indicating his Spartan origins, but we know almost nothing about his career prior to the First Punic War. According to our sources, he was a mercenary commander hired during the earlier stages of the conflict, and evidently had enough experience with the structure of the Punic army to openly criticize it, at which the higher Carthaginian command took notice and brought Xanthippus to give an explanation. True to his laconic roots, Xanthippus was blunt in his assessment of the situation, and recommended that he be put in charge of the city's defense. While the Carthaginian army certainly had foreign officers, it was an unprecedented move to hand over total control to this Spartan expatriate. It also might be narratively convenient that a single Greek would be the saving grace of Carthage, but this is what all of the sources tell us. Through drill and forced marches, Xanthippus was able to restore discipline and order into the ranks of the Carthaginian army, which seemed to give the soldiers additional hope after seeing the stark comparison in the competency of the Spartan versus their earlier commanders. Confident in his chances, Xanthippus took an army of about 12,000 infantry, 4,000 cavalry, and about 100 elephants to face the Romans outside of Tunis, near the Bagratus River. For the first time in the war, the Carthaginian citizenry was conscripted to shore up their numbers for a land operation, and trained by their Spartan commander to form a phalanx in the center line, while the mercenaries would flank them on both sides. The Carthaginian cavalry was placed on the wings, and in one of the rare excellent maneuvers with war elephants, Xanthippus placed all the pachyderms in a single line some distance ahead of the main body. Regulus had attempted to counteract the elephants by forming his maniples deep and short, shrinking his line in order to present a more formidable barrier, with a number of skirmishers placed ahead to pepper the beast with javelins. The consul had now committed two grievous errors. The first was leaving the more hilly Tunis in order to seize a quick victory on flatter terrain and the second was to condense his army, both of which disregarded the numerical superiority of the Roman legionaries and gave advantage to the much larger Carthaginian cavalry, which outnumbered the Romans' horsemen eight to one. As the battle began, the Roman infantry charged the incoming elephants, and were able to put up a valiant fight despite the number of legionaries crushed or gored to death, and the Roman left actually managed to rout the mercenaries on the Carthaginian right back to their camp. This merely was a fleeting moment of triumph as the Roman cavalry, woefully outnumbered and outskilled by the Carthaginians, was quickly put to flight. The densely packed legionaries were now easy pickings by the elephants, the flanking Numidian horsemen, and the vigorously aggressive Carthaginian citizenry, which had been held in reserve and released into the Roman rank and file, who had begun to panic and were nearly cut down to a man. What would be known as the Battle of Tunis, or the Battle of the Bagratus River, was a smashing Carthaginian victory, destroying the 15,000-strong Roman invasion force and leaving only 2,500 alive, with 500 in Carthaginian captivity. The remaining 2,000, the group that had initially pushed to the Carthaginian camp, managed to escape back to Aspis, where they held out under siege, and by the end of 255 were rescued by a Roman fleet. The consul Regulus was among those captured by the Carthaginians, and despite his defeat, he became something of a martyr and model of civic virtue allegedly sent to convince the Roman Senate to sign a peace treaty, but directly sabotaged the efforts, and willingly returned back to Carthage. There he would either die of natural causes a few years later, or, as the story goes, was tortured to death for his transgressions. Xanthippus, the savior of Carthage, seems to have fared little better. According to Polybius, the Spartan had left the city under the pretense that Carthaginian leadership had grown jealous of him, while other more scandalous writers suggest that the Carthaginians attempted to, or successfully had, Xanthippus murdered. But it is also very likely that he had gone to Egypt, his name appearing as one of the mercenaries serving in the retinue of Ptolemy III Eurigetes. Amazingly, the Carthaginians had managed to turn seemingly imminent defeat into a major victory, and the Romans would not step foot onto African soil until the Battle of Zama nearly 50 years later. The loss of over 10,000 Roman soldiers was a military catastrophe not seen since the days of Pyrrhus, and put an end to the string of victories that almost assured the end of the war in Rome's favor. But nobody would be able to guess that their conflict would continue to rage for another 15 years, a point which Polybius muses on given the sudden reversals of fortune that simply would escalate the conflict and lead to tens of thousands of further deaths but almost no price was too high for both Rome and Carthage to ensure that victory would be achieved. 
and the rest of the conflict would be determined by the actions both on the sea and the battlegrounds of Sicily. Anyone who has sailed the Mediterranean can tell you that the weather turns on a dime, and when a storm brews, you're at the mercy of Mother Nature. The Romans learned this the hard way in 255, when the fleet that had initially rescued the survivors of the African invasion was soon ravaged by the wind and rocking seas, resulting in the destruction of 284 out of 364 ships, a staggering loss of approximately 100,000 sailors in a single event, if we based it on Polybius' figures equivalent to two battles of Cannae. Undeterred, the Romans managed to rebuild 220 ships in less than three months. But despite this, the Roman fleet was struck with yet another disaster in the summer of 253, as a storm destroyed an additional 150 vessels. These two events had soured the Roman interest in shipbuilding, no doubt because of its enormous expenses, but also because of the great loss of human life. Compared to the successes at Echnomus and Milai, the recent failure ship focused back to the land operations in Sicily, and the Romans were successfully whittling away Carthaginian strongholds on the island, despite the destruction of Acragas by the Punic general Carthalo. The smaller settlements of Therma, Cephaloidium, and Lepara were taken by siege, but the true prize was Panormus, the modern Palermo, one of the largest Carthaginian cities in Sicily, and an important harbor. There was not much in the way of a military response on the Carthaginians' part, which seems to have relaxed the Senate enough to recall one of the consular armies by 251 BC, leaving Lucius Caecilius Metellus in charge. However, the Punic commander Hadsdrubal, who had been sent to the city of Lilibium a few years prior, had been planning a counterattack to take back Panormus, which he would launch in the summer of 251. Instead of taking the headstrong approach, Metellus decided to sit tight within the fortifications of the city and lure Hasdrubal into a trap. The burning and raiding of Panormus's crops without reprisal emboldened the Carthaginian commander to ferry his troops across the Orethus River, which bordered the city walls. This also included the 100 or so elephants that Hasdrubal brought with him, and when the beasts were close enough in range, the Roman skirmishers who had been hidden in moats and ditches emerged and stung the beasts with javelins and other missiles, driving many of them mad with pain as their mahouts eagerly rode towards the Roman line. The elephants began to rampage and crush several Carthaginians to death, and with a fresh group of legionaries, Metellus led the charge against the shaken Punic line, driving them to a rout as the remaining elephants were captured, an image that survives in a Roman denarius minted by a later descendant of the Caecilia Metellii. With this success, the Roman Senate reopened the front on the Mediterranean Sea and pursued the more ambitious goal of taking the harbor of Drapana and the city of Lilibium, the modern Marsala. Lilibium was easily the most fortified city in Carthaginian-held territory, with sturdy walls and battlements that were backed up against a shallow sea that was difficult to navigate, yet easy to resupply, making it similar in geography to the later Constantinople, and Pyrrhus of Epirus unsuccessfully attempted to capture it during his war in Sicily. Taking Lilibium would effectively spell the end of Punic presence on the island, and the Senate wanted to try and cut off the reinforcements and supplies the Carthaginians would inevitably try to bring in. It would prove to be the greatest siege of the entire conflict, though I doubt the Romans would have guessed to the extent to which it would drag on for. In 250, the Roman Senate lifted the temporary ban on naval activities to raise the fleet of 200 ships to blockade the city while the consular armies began the siege operations. The Carthaginians weren't caught unawares by this, and at the same time as the initial setup, the Admiral Hannibal had a fleet of 50 ships and about 10,000 mercenaries approach close to Lilibium wait for a favorable wind, and sail straight through the Roman blockade into the harbor completely unmolested. While certainly daring, this would be the only time such a large-scale reinforcement of the city would occur, and the Romans quickly rectified their errors. While the Hellenistic powers were in possession of the most advanced siege craft of the day, famously exemplified by the likes of Demetrius Polyarchetes during the Siege of Rhodes, the Romans were proving themselves adept in the construction of gargantuan siege engines and siege tactics, which would make them the greatest city-takers of the ancient world. Polybius describes the single-mindedness with which the Romans pursued their goal, and the ferocity of the Carthaginian defenders in repelling their efforts. 
Catapults and stone throwers would barrage the city walls, while sappers dug tunnels underneath to collapse the stone structures, while the defenders sent nightly expeditions to burn the machines, or counterdig, and repair the walls. Back and forth it went on, and though the Romans nearly managed to take the city through treachery of a mercenary officer, nothing came of it year after year, leaving a standoff between both parties. The lack of any serious progress frustrated the Roman commanders, partially the consul of 249, Publius Claudius Pulcher. Publius was the founder of the Pulcri branch of the Claudii, which would be host to some of the most unsavory individuals in the history of the Republic. His sister Claudia was later fined by Roman officials for openly wishing that more of the plebs would have drowned in the sea when her litter was hindered by a crowd. And it appears that Publius was no less headstrong than his descendants. He convened the military tribunes and officers into a council, and argued that in order to secure Lilibium, they must first capture Drapana, which apparently was understaffed and unprepared for any sort of Roman sortie. This would be the first major naval engagement since Cape Ecnomus nearly seven years prior, and the Senate sent 10,000 fresh rowers to staff the ships for the operation. It is said that before the start of the engagement, Publius was consulting the sacred chickens of Rome for a favorable omen by offering them grain. And after the chickens refused the gift many times over, the consul was so enraged that he took the chickens and hurled them into the sea, claiming that if the chickens would not eat, then let them drink instead. Obviously, this was a major sacrilege and a forebear of what was to come, though this story seems to appear only with later writers like Livy and Cicero, as Polybius does not mention it, and it could be argued that this apparent moral and unpious failure was an excuse on the part of the Romans as to why the battle turned out the way it did. Overnight, the Roman fleet of about 210 crafts sailed northbound towards Drapana with the coast on its right and the sight of the vessels at dawn alerted the Carthaginian commander, Adderbal, who immediately called for all sailors and mercenaries to man their ships. By the skin of their teeth, Adderbal's fleet managed to sail out of the harbor on the opposite bank of where the Romans had entered, surprising Publius, who expected that his aggressiveness would have compelled the Carthaginians to surrender in the port. Instead of escaping, Adderbal had swung his fleet around a couple of nearby islands and headed to confront the Romans in an open battle but the compact mouth of the harbor and sudden need to form into a battle-ready line caused Publius's ships significant turmoil before they were finally ready. When the two sides finally clashed, they were evenly matched when they actually came to blows. But the problem was that the Romans' position kept their backs against the coastline, and the Carthaginian crews were far more adept at performing the maneuvers to ram the Roman ships and quickly return behind their own line to the open sea. Before long, the Roman fleet was being torn apart, and the consul escaped with only about 30 ships, with 93 captured and an unknown number sunk by the Carthaginians. The Battle of Drapana was the worst defeat that the Romans had yet suffered in the war, and the worst naval defeat in all of Roman history, until perhaps the Battle of Cape Bon nearly 700 years later. Publius was blasted in Rome by his critics for his loss, and actually put on trial for incompetence only managing to come off with a severe fine, while his fellow consul allegedly committed suicide to avoid prosecution, while Adderbal was given a hero's welcome in Carthage. Though this was definitely a major victory, both sides had started to run on fumes. The Carthaginians were not able to capitalize on the victory to any extent, and the Roman siege of Lilibium continued on undeterred. If the Carthaginians were going to have a chance at making it through the next few years, they were going to need another Xanthippus. While they wouldn't get a miracle worker, they certainly would get the next best thing. His name was Hamilcar Barca. While the losses at Drapana proved to be devastating, there still remained a Roman fleet that was able to lay siege to Lilibium. In 248, Adderbal had organized a mission headed by his commander Cartholo to destroy the surviving ships moored near Lilibium. But the Carthaginian ships were actually repelled by the skilled deployment of mounted ballistae and other artillery on the Roman vessels. Luckily for Cartholo, it seemed that he ultimately would achieve his objective, since the vigorous defense by the Romans left them trapped along a coastline that was unsuitable for docking, and a sudden storm had dashed the densely packed Romans against one another yet again destroying the remainder of the fleet. This was most fortunate for the Carthaginians, 
and it would be expected that they would now focus their attention on landing as many ground troops into Sicily in order to break the Roman siege. However, it seems that the Carthaginian Senate decide not to press on this advantage. Since the Battle of Echnomus, the Carthaginians had been fighting another war on their home soil against the Numidians, Libyans, and various other tribes of North Africa who had revolted, and the commander known as Hanno the Great was having considerable success in penetrating into the African interior. It was decided that, instead of focusing on Rome exclusively, the Carthaginian forces would be split up between the African and Sicilian theaters. The commander of the Sicilian army would be Hamilcar Barca, a relatively young man by the time he assumed his position, and while we know very little of his background, he was a member of the Carthaginian aristocracy. Polybius speaks of Hamilcar with high praises, and considers him the best commander of the entire war. But compared to his contemporary in Africa, he was given relatively few resources and manpower to commit to the war in Sicily. Hamilcar spent the years 247 to 243 by taking advantage of a lack of a formal Roman navy, and set up shop in what is known as Hercte, which is possibly Mount Castellaccio, and was a well-defended elevated region, which allowed him to sail up and down and plunder southwestern Italy with hit-and-run strikes. The effect of this operation was a mixed success, as he was able to try and disrupt the supply chain of the Roman besiegers, but at the same time, they had to defend against Roman counterattacks, and lost a fair amount of troops in the process. By 243, Hamilcar realized that he needed to head closer to the remaining Punic heartland, and appropriately moved under the cover of night to a town called Eryx, which had been captured by the Romans in 248, and located near the besieged Drapana. There, he and his army settled into the slopes of the nearby Mount Eryx, and quickly captured the town. His new raids drew the attention of the Romans, who were frustrated by the hindering of their progress. One of the consuls named Gaius Fundanius actually managed to defeat Hamilcar in one of these skirmishes, and when the Punic commander requested a temporary truce to retrieve his dead, the consul mocked him and outright refused. Soon the tables had turned, and Fundanius' force was obliterated. In a twist of irony, he was forced to request a treaty to collect his dead. Diodorus Siculus, in one of his rare concessions to the Carthaginians, says that Hamilcar allowed the retrieval of the Roman bodies, since, quote, he was at war with the living, but had come to terms with the dead. At this point, the final years of the war worn both Rome and Carthage down to the nub. The finances of both sides were in major arrears. Carthage had to debase its currency to a third of its original silver content, and they requested a loan of 2,000 talents from Ptolemy II of Egypt, which was denied. The Romans weren't faring much better either, as they were not accumulating as much wartime booty, nor was King Hero of Syracuse obligated to pay a war indemnity after the year 248, and the repeated naval disasters required them to suspend the construction of new ships altogether, instead turning to the private citizen for a wartime loan to fund a building initiative based upon another recently captured Carthaginian ship. There's a little explanation as to why this ship is different than any previously captured Punic vessels, but the funds were gathered to outfit an additional 200 quincareems, as the Senate was looking to make one last gamble. By 242, the siege of Lilibium was still dragging on after almost eight years, and the Romans were close to exhaustion. The consul at the time, Gaius Lutatius Catulus, felt that the war needed to be won on the sea, and so he retrained the fleet, giving them the best nutrition and instilling a sense of discipline. The goal was to draw the Carthaginian navy out by cutting off the supplies of Hamilcar's forces at Eryx, and the Punic command responded by sending out a squadron of around 250 ships about nine months later in late February or early March of 241, stationing themselves near the Egates Islands. Comparing both navies, the Carthaginian crews were hastily gathered, poorly trained, and poorly equipped, and were led by Hanno, the same men responsible for the defeats at both Agrigentum and Echnomus. Not to mention, they were also loaded with supplies that were destined for the Punic defenders, making them sluggish and overburdened. Word of the Carthaginian presence was received by Lutatius, who quickly sailed to meet them head-on. On March 10th, 241 BC, the consul's gamble paid off, as the Romans smashed the unprepared and underqualified Carthaginian fleet, who tried as they might to defend themselves from the onslaught of ramming ships, but thousands would be captured in the aftermath. 
the Battle of the Igatis Islands, though without much of a description to go on, would prove to be the final nail in the coffin for the Carthaginian war effort. Though Punic forces were still operating in Sicily, especially under Hamilcar Barca, the bankruptcy of the Carthaginian treasury had sapped the will to reconstruct their fleet, and they could no longer provide supplies to the defenders of Lilibium or Drapana. Rather than risk the remaining officers and soldiers who were now left to the mercy of the Romans, the Carthaginian Senate had sent a message to Hamilcar to cease all operations, and tell the Roman consul that terms for peace should be met. The Barcid commander dutifully followed these orders, and met with Lutatius to negotiate an end to the war, something that was eagerly agreed to since the Romans themselves were at the brink. The Treaty of Lutatius, as it would come to be called, was initially agreed to as follows, quote, The Carthaginians are entirely to evacuate Sicily, and are not to make war on Hero, nor bear arms against Syracuse or the allies of Syracuse. The Carthaginians are to return to the Romans all their prisoners without ransom. The Carthaginians are to pay the Romans an indemnity of 2,200 talents over a period of 20 years. End quote. This essentially was the handshake deal, but when the draft was sent back to Rome, the Senate and People's Assembly demanded harsher terms, raising the indemnity to 3,200 talents and reducing the payback period to only 10 years. And the evacuation was expanded to include Sardinia and all of the other islands between Sicily and Italy. Though this must have felt like double dealing, there was little that Hamilcar or the Carthaginians could do about it, and it would be ratified by the late summer of 241, ending the First Punic War after 24 years of continuous fighting. Lutatius would celebrate a triumph in early October, and he and his brother would stay in Sicily to oversee the evacuation and organize the new local government. The Mamertines, the root cause of all of the fighting since their arrival to Sicily nearly five decades prior to the end of the war, were able to enjoy their old age in central Italy, where they were forcibly relocated and absorbed, though the people who dwelled in Messana were known as Mamertines long afterwards. King Hero was able to enjoy his rule of Syracuse as a both a friend and ally of the Roman people, while Carthage had to focus on rebuilding and paying back the indemnity. Since we started the discussion on what were the causes of the First Punic War, it's now time to ask, what were the consequences? In regards to Rome, the loss of life was staggering. According to Polybius' best estimates, the Romans lost somewhere around 700 ships and other sailing vessels, and based upon my own rough calculations of about 400 crew members per ship, accounting for variance, it comes out to approximately 280,000 people, many of them due to the storms and the weather rather than Carthaginian prowess. This seems to be indicated by the records of censuses taken from the city at the beginning and near the end of the war, going from 292,000 in the year 265 to only 241,000 in the year 247. And although some of these figures have been put into question, this only takes the male Roman citizen population into account, and such losses would have affected Latin, Italian, and Greek allies that the crews would have been drawn from. The destruction of the fleets nearly bankrupted the Roman treasury several times over, forcing the Senate to take loans from private citizens just to continue. Despite this, the Romans had taken their first real step to empire and acquired immensely valuable and productive lands in Sicily, Sardinia, and Corsica. The war had begun to change the policies by which Rome had ruled over its territory. Previously, all of their subjugated foes were absorbed into their system of the Succhii and Italian allies in order to provide military service. No such thing for Carthage, since it was unlikely that the Romans themselves were in any shape to enforce such a policy, and the newly acquired overseas territory was either governed by King Hero, who was to provide vast amounts of grain to feed the exploding population of Rome, or headed by a governor, a praetor, who oversaw the extraction of taxes rather than military service. The financial exhaustion of the Carthaginians, such as the debasement of whatever currency they could mint, would prove to have immediate and dire consequences. The large amount of mercenaries hired by Carthage during the war had been allowed to aggregate together near the city itself and their mutual anger at the lack of payment in conjunction with resentful indigenous North Africans was a recipe for disaster, resulting in the mercenary or truceless war that raged for over three years on Carthaginian soil. 
This was an existential crisis on a far greater scale than Regulus's invasion in 256, and widespread atrocities were committed on both sides until the inspired leadership of Hamilcar Barca carried Carthage through to victory. Carthage in time would cover, but we will consider this our breaking point in the narrative, and in future episodes we'll definitely cover the affairs of both Rome and Carthage between the First and Second Punic Wars. However, the resentment from the Harsh Treaty may have ultimately contributed to the outbreak of the Second Punic War, much like it has been theorized that the Treaty of Versailles in 1919 led to the outbreak of the Second World War. According to tradition, Hamilcar continued to nurse a grudge against the Romans, believing them to be the culprits and architects of his people's misery, and that had the Carthaginian Senate persisted, they would have been able to beat them. Unfortunately for Hamilcar, he would not live to see his mission to fight the Romans to be carried out, but instead it would be deferred to his son, a young boy who was to swear an oath to the gods to never cease being an enemy to the Roman people. His name was Hannibal, and he would be the greatest enemy that Rome would ever face. So ends our look at the First Punic War. If you're looking for general overviews on the First Punic War, I leaned heavily on The Fall of Carthage by Adrian Goldsworthy and Mastering the West by Dexter Hoyos. If you're looking for something focusing on the naval warfare side of the First Punic War, then I'd recommend Christa Steinbe's Rome vs. Carthage, The War at Sea. These books and the rest of my bibliography can be found in the notes for this episode on my website at www.hellenisticagepodcast.wordpress.com. If you have enjoyed the show, consider supporting it by donating through my coffee page or by checking out my Amazon wish list for requested research materials or even by just simply leaving a review and feedback on the platform of your choice. These links, including links to my social media accounts, will be provided in the podcast description for you to peruse at your convenience. Next time, we'll be delving into the world of Hellenistic philosophy. And until then... You've been listening to The Hellenistic Age Podcast.